Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles, open up your Bibles to St. John chapter 17. St. John chapter 17. We're continuing on in the, in the short series, Unity in the Body of Christ. Unity in the body of Christ. Last week we talked about, you know, the prayer of Christ. And we're going to read that prayer again, or at least portions of that prayer, not the whole prayer that's in St. John chapter 17. It's not the Our Father prayer where he taught us how to pray in a pattern of prayer, but it's the prayer that he prayed to the Father himself for us. Amen. And we're going to be talking about that some more. You know, last week we covered, you know, that there's no divisions in the body. There should be no divisions, but yet there are. And there's divisions through uh, uh, denominationalism and, and religion, and there's divisions all across the world. But until the Christian people are united as one, as Christ prayed that we be united, we will not be able to really affect the world's problems until we, can, uh, until we change our own in the body of Christ. There should be unity in the body of Christ. Yes, there's divisions in politics, there's racial divide, there's the divide in social economical uh, divide, there's all kind of divide in this world. But when the church is united, it will break those barriers that keep people apart and make us one as we should be one. If you're in St. John, amen, let me get there very quickly, St. John, Chapter 17. Say amen when you get there. St. John chapter 17. And I'm going to read, starting at verse 11. Verse 11, it says this. And now, and this is Jesus praying. He says, and now I am no more of the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, O heavenly Father, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. Then drop down to verse 20, and then he continued on in his prayer, and he says this, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The glory and the glory which thou gave me, I gave, excuse me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as, even as meaning in the same manner, manner and likeness as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Amen. We'll stop right there. Amen. And, and as we talked last week, this was Jesus' prayer. We went very detailed into this prayer. And, and the fact that God wants us to be one, one body, one body. Now, if you have your Bibles, look over in, in, in Psalms chapter 33, 133. Psalms chapter 133. And we're just going to read verse 1, and then we'll, get, we'll launch into the lesson. Amen. But in Psalms 133, it starts out by saying, behold. Behold means, look at this. Give me your attention. Check this out. You know, uh, uh, I think in, in, in Spanish, and y'all correct me if it's wrong, uh, uh, I think they would say, mira, mira, is that correct? Or something like that. Hey, I want you to see this. I want you to pay attention to this. I want you to see says, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together, how? In unity. In unity. In unity. Unity in the body of Christ. The Bible says how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. But how are we to do that? You know, God gives us a pattern of how this should be done. And it should be done, first of all, as we accept 
accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. It is not about religion. It doesn't matter what religious background that we may have. In this church, we have people of several different religious backgrounds. We have people that are Catholic. We have people that are Baptist. We have people that are Pentecostal. We have people that are the Assemblies of God, which is a Pentecostal as well. Uh, but we have people of several backgrounds as members of this church. And when we came together as one body, not because, well, I'm, I'm of this and I'm of that. And we found out in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 1 where Paul said, is Christ divided? And some of you are saying, I'm of Paul and I'm of Paulus and I'm of Cephas. Um, and I'm of, uh, uh, of, you know, of, of many different things. And these, all these names represent, represent the various different denominations or religions there are even in the Christian religion. And even... And, and what makes us Christians is that we believe in Jesus Christ. That he came, he died, and he rose again. To be saved, we must believe in our heart and confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus. That Jesus is Lord. And that's the problem with some people. People want to be saved. People want to go to heaven, but they don't want to accept Jesus as Lord. And if Jesus is not Lord, he's not Savior. And a lot of people don't want to hear the truth. You know that. They don't want to hear the truth. They think religion is what's going to get them to heaven. But religion gets no one to heaven. Jesus said in John chapter 14. And I said this last week. Verse, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man come to the Father except by me. He is the only way. For God so loved the world. He gave his son. God's not sending anyone to hell. Which I say all the time. But he sent everyone the way out. Religion is man's efforts to reach heaven without God. Or it's man's efforts to reach God. But Jesus Christ, not the religion of Christianity, but Jesus Christ himself. Because Jesus never brought a religion. He brought a relationship with man and with God. Because the Bible tells us that sin separated us from God. And when we are separated from God because of the sin nature of man, Every man, woman, boy, and girl got to come this way. God sent everyone the way out. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. And all things are of God, who have reconciled us where? To himself, by Jesus Christ. Amen. And so, today we're going to be coming out of Ephesians chapter 4. And how this is done. How this is done. Through the word of God. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Say amen when you get there. Ephesians chapter 4. Amen. In Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm going to read, so I'm going to start at verse 1. But I'm going to key on verse 3 and then key on some other verses in this chapter. And then we're going to jump over to a, a few other books of the Bible. But he says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you've been called. Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you've been called. With all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, and watch this word, forbearing one another in love. Forbearing. That means even putting up with one another. Sometimes, look, God wants us to love one another. Now, that don't mean we got to like everything about somebody. I love my brother. My, my, my brother Larry, me and Larry are close. Um, I, but I don't like everything about my brother. And he's my, he's my brother from my mother. He, he is my, my blood biological brother. But we forbear one another. The things that, that we can't stand when we were growing up, sometimes we would get in fights. You know, I don't know if you ever fought your brother or your sister, but sometimes we would get in fights, Larry and I. Or look, and, but, but he, and him being older and me younger, you know, mama had to teach him, well, well, well Larry, sometimes you gotta put up with your little brother. Forbear him. Forbear him, put up with him sometimes. And then I had to learn to put up with some of my brother's nonsense, or at least what I thought was nonsense. But forbearing one another, he said here. He says forbearing one another, how? 
in love. In love, in a, in a marriage relationship. And I'm going to tell you, when you first meet someone and, and, and you know, you get all goo-eyed behind that person, you know, and and they're very charming. The, 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 the man is very charming at first, and, and then the woman is on her best behavior as well. And then after y'all been together a while, you start seeing some traits and some habits that they got that you may not like. But because you love that person, and your relationship grows, you forbear one another. You put up with one another. And, it's, and now, 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 I'm not talking about putting up with being mistreated. I mean, if something gets violent and someone begins to mistreat you, then they don't really love you if they're mistreating you. That ain't love. That ain't love. But when you love someone and you see that, you know, well, he's not as clean as I thought he was because he leaves his socks all over the house. You know, okay, well, either put up with it or, or pick them up. Throw them in the basket. If you pick them, you know, this is something I learned. If there's a habit your spouse have, and I say spouse, because you should be married if you're in the same place together. Should be married. You know, that's, this shacking up business, it, it, that's not a dog. But if your spouse has started some habits, and they leave stuff laying around, and you don't like it, tell them. And after you tell them, don't continue to complain about it. Don't continue to do something about it. Okay, just, just pick it up. And then I bet they'll tell you, you know, I was going to do that. Yeah, you was going to, but you didn't. So I took care of it. And after a while, they'll get tired of you doing, I don't know, some of them will. Will get tired of you doing what they should have done. And they'll do it themselves. Now, some men, women, there, there's some men, they just don't get lazy and stay lazy. Oh, is she picking it up? I don't have to pick it up now. But forbear one another in love. Forbear one another. Verse 3 endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit of the bonds of peace. Now the word endeavoring is doing your best, trying your hardest to keep the unity in the spirit. To keep the unity of the spirit in the bonds of peace. In the bonds of peace. Endeavoring. So, so doing your best. Working your hardest to keep unity in the body of Christ. It says Verse 4, there is one body. How many bodies are there? One. How many bodies are there? One. How many bodies are there? One. But though there is one body, the body of Christ, and the scripture is going to tell us that, we do have separate entities or separate bodies in the sense of local denominations or local churches or groups. But yet, even though we're, we're, we're separate, we're still one in Jesus Christ. And that's why we all must be unified together, not divided by your religion or your denomination. Now, if something is not a Christian religion, if we want to say it that way, if something is, it is Buddhist or, or Muslim or something like that, then they're not in Christ. They're not in the body. They're just in a religion. They're, they're just, but even once again, being in the religion of Christianity don't get you in heaven. You have to be in Christ yourself. Just because we go to church, I said this before, that bears reiterating, I can sit in a garage, that don't make me a car. Because I sit in church, that don't make me saved or right with God. So just coming to church or doing the rituals, if there hasn't been a change on the inside of us, and the Lord Jesus Christ have not come into our lives to be our Lord and our Savior. Because if Jesus is not Lord, he will not be Savior. And we have to surrender ourselves to his Lordship. And that's the hardest thing for man to do because we want to keep control. We want control. But Jesus said, for those, if you was to save yourself, you're going to lose yourself. You're going to lose yourself. He who saves his life shall lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake shall save it. Is that not what Christ said? He said, you've got to surrender. You've got to give up. You've got to take up your cross and follow me. He said, there is one body and one spirit as, even as ye are called into one hope of your calling. 
one hope. And that hope, that, that blessed hope, is that after this life is over, because this life is going to end. One way or another, either Jesus is coming back, this world's going to end, the world's going to be destroyed by fire next time, and not by water. But the only true hope we have is in Jesus Christ because he takes us to the Father. He, so after this life is over, what's your hope? Do you have hope for eternal life? That your spirit will live on, either in heaven or in hell. But do you want to live on in eternal torment or eternal bliss and eternal glory with God? But he says that's our hope, our eternal hope. Once again, verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, even as you are called into one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. How many? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. But aren't there many faiths? Aren't there many faiths? We call them faiths because they're the name in which we believe under. I came up a Baptist. Someone else may have came up a Catholic. Someone else a Pentecostal. But those are just the names in which we believe under. What was our hope in? Our hope was in God through his son, Jesus Christ. Those were the banners, that's all. They're not our faith. Our faith should be in God. The Bible says in Mark chapter 11, verse 22, uh, uh, verse 23, have faith in God. Who are we to have faith in? Have faith in God. Not in our denomination, not in our religion. Because there's one Lord, and that Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ. There's one faith, and that's faith in God and what Jesus did. That's why the Bible tells us in, the, in, in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, that if we will confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. This is the only way to be saved. It's to confess Jesus as Lord and believe what God is doing through him, that God is in Christ reconciling the world back to himself. Back to himself. One Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Well, well, well you mean we got to get baptized? In, you know, I was baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. I was baptized in the name of Jesus. Well, I was sprinkled. And it, no, there's one baptism. And it's not talking about the various different water baptisms. But it's talking about the baptism into his body, into the body of Christ. And you're going to see that in the scripture. That when you were baptized, not in water, but when you had a converted heart and your heart was toward God, that the Holy Spirit took you and submerged you into the body of Christ. He says, once again, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto, a, verse 7 now, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the, the gift of Christ. Wherefore he said when he ascended upon high he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. Now this is where I tell people Jesus went to hell for you. The Bible says that the sins of the world was placed on Jesus on the cross. Your sins and mine. Your sins and mine. And when the sins of the world were placed on Jesus, and he died and he says, Father, it is finished. And the Bible says he descended because the wages of sin is death. And he went to hell for you. And he took your sins and mine to hell. And he put them in prison. And when he rose again, the Bible says he rose in the newness of life. He rose as the firstborn of the resurrection so that we will know that we will live also. He also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. And then the Bible says, he that descended is the same. Also that ascended up far above all heaven, that he might fill all, all things. Now, he, 
Once again, he took the blood, the atonement. See, in the Old Testament, they had the, 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 the blood of the lamb that they placed on the altar. And the fragrance of the blood uh, and the uh, went up to heaven. The Bible says it was as a sweet smelling savor. And it went up to God. God saw the sacrifice. And when he saw the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for us, he was the sacrifice. He, he went to heaven. He ascended above all that he might feel all things. He filled all the, the requirements of the law. He filled all the requirements that of the law, the Bible lets us know. Verse 11, and it says that he gave some, and this is how, this is how we know we need to be unified. Because he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And verse 12 says, for what reason? For the, for the perfecting of the saints. Now, I know in some religions they say, you know, you got to go through certain canonization to be called a saint. There's got to be certain things proved. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that once you give your life to Jesus Christ, you become a saint right now. You're no longer a sinner. You know, and I hear some people say, I'm a sinner saved by grace. No, I was a sinner. But now that I'm saved by grace, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God and not by works, least any man should boast. So we are saved by grace. We're no longer sinners, even though you still may sin. But when your heart is after God, your efforts will not be to sin, but it's to stay far away from sin as you can. But sometimes you may slip up, and when I say slip up, I mean slip up. I don't mean you purposely do something and say, well, God forgive me. No, if you plan something, that's like premeditated murder. If you plan to do something, you plan to do it. And God called that vain repentance. In other words, your repentance was worth nothing because you did not truly repent. And to repent is to turn away from sin and turn to God. So, so he wants to perfect us and he calls us saints. And you are a saint of God. You are, you become a child of God. The Bible says an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. In other words, the same privileges and rights that Jesus have in heaven with God, you have also. Because God promised them to you. And I. Once again, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, for the building up of the body of Christ. Of what? The body of Christ. Not building up of this religion and that religion or this church and that church, but the body of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and the cunning and crafty this whereby they lie and wait to deceive but speak the truth in what in love and that we may grow up into him in all things which is the head even Christ verse 16 from whom the whole body the whole what the whole body. body fitly joined together and compact by that which every joint supplied, according to the effectual workings in the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. To the building up of itself, how? In love. See, when we're unified as one body, we're perfected. And we're unified and we edify, we build one another up. How? In love. In love. Now next week I'm going to talk deep about that love that should be in the body. I'm going to get deep into that next week. But this week I'm talking about the body. Now look with me uh, at Romans chapter 12. Go to Romans chapter 12. If you're in Ephesians, just go backwards a little bit and you'll end up in Romans. Say amen when you get there. Now, hold your finger in Romans or your bookmark. Like me, I got all these bookmarks. Hold your bookmarks in Romans. And you're going to go back to Romans. And then, 
put a bookmark in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now let's look at Romans chapter 12. Verse, verse 4 and verse 5. He says, and, and you can read the whole thing, but I'm gonna, I, I, I got to uh, break this down for y'all so that, it, you know, for the, for the sake of time. It says, for as we have many members, we have what? Many members in one body. And all members have not the same office. In other words, I said this last week. In your body, you got many different parts. On your body, I got a foot, I got a hand, I got a head, I got an ear, nose, mouth, eyes, I got a back, got arms. You know, there are many parts. But even inside of the body, there are many parts in the body. And the Bible lets us know, once again, for as we are many members in where? The body. Whose body? The body of Jesus Christ. We are many members in the body, and all members have not the same office or the same function. The office means the same function. Your, your toes don't have the same functions your fingers have. Your nose don't have the same function your ears have. Your eyes don't have the same function as your belly has. And you can name parts all day long, but you know what I'm talking about. None of us have the same. God has something for every one of us. And he has tempered the body together. And he said we are members in particular. Look with me in verse 5. And it says, so we, being many, are one body in Christ. And every one member, every one members one of another. We are members one of another. In other words, we are joined together. We are part of one another. There's no big eyes and little use. Though I am the pastor, I, I am no more significant to God than any of you are. Some people put, put yes, you, you're supposed to respect your pastor and, and respect those that are in office, this, that, and the other. But you don't set us up on any high pedestal. The only person to be worshipped is God and his son, Jesus Christ. That's all. We're of one body. We're of one body. You see that. Now jump with me, and, uh, and, and even you can read this whole thing later on yourself. But now let's jump over to Corinthians, like I said. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I'm going to start reading at verse 12. Just once again for the sake of time. And we're talking about the body. The body being one. And that Jesus prayed that we be one. What did he pray? That we be one. Say that with me, everybody. That we, we be, be one. one. Even hold your finger up last time. That we, we be, be one. one. He prayed that we be one. All joined together. Just because we're at my Lord's house of prayer, our church should be joined together in friendship and in fellowship with, with New Hope, with Somerset Baptist, with with. Uh, 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 the Assemblies of God, you know, with the First Methodist, with the Methodist, United Methodist Church, with the Catholic Church, with the other church down the street, we all should be joined in one, having the same mind and the same understanding. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Look with me at verse 12. Are you there? For as the body is, there's that again, one. The body is what? One. How many times have we seen that already? And I told you before, and I taught you here at my Lord's house of prayer, when God reiterates something more than twice, more than three times, he really means for it to happen. God doesn't joke around anyway. If he said it once, he meant for it to happen. Because this is a book of commandments. This is a book of, 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 of wisdom, and knowledge, and understanding. Not a book of suggestions. It's not a suggestion. He commands that we be one. And I'll show you all that even more. Hallelujah. Once again, for as the body is one and have many members and all the members of the one body being many are one body. So also is Christ. And he used the example of our bodies. So our body is one body. We got many members. So is Christ. And then he went on to say, 
For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Didn't I tell you I was going to show you that in the scripture? That the Holy Spirit takes us when we accept Jesus Christ and he puts us, he submerges us. See, baptism is not 